Well, good morning. I'm uh, here with you this morning as we begin to look at uh, uh, another section of First Peter and uh, enjoying our worship service uh, through Facebook Live. And uh, want to welcome each and every one of you who are uh, participating this morning. Those of you who are part of uh, Living Hope Alliance Church, and for those of you who are joining in because you were invited uh, by friends or uh, you simply found us on uh, Facebook. So I say welcome to you. And here we are again in the midst of this uh, uh, coronavirus, and uh, we have to maintain doing it through Facebook Live. Now, for those who are unable to be with us at this time, uh, it does record and stay on the page. And you can, uh, uh, if you ask some of your friends to, to look at this, you can, they can come to our page and uh, they can see this. Also, I will be posting this on YouTube so that uh, uh, those that uh, prefer not to use Facebook can see this on YouTube simply by uh, looking up How Great a Salvation. Whatever the title of the message is, that will be embedded in the YouTube uh, recording, and you'll be able to find it that way as well. Also, if you have an opportunity and you feel uh, like you would be willing to do that, we would appreciate it if you would uh, share this video uh, on your timeline. And uh, that way, uh, if your friends would like to watch this, they can do that as well. It helps to uh, spread the message a little bit. So as you are uh, here, uh, in First Peter, I hope you have your your Bibles open uh, to First Peter chapter one, and we'll be looking at verses ten through twelve, and we'll be looking at the concept of how great a salvation. Also, I'd like to remind you that uh, there's a kids video uh, that's uh, on the Facebook page after we're done or maybe you've already done it, had the opportunity to do it. Uh, I found out last week some of the adults were uh, who don't have children were actually watching the video and enjoy it. So be, feel welcome to do that as well. Uh, also, there are songs uh, provided for you as, as part of our worship. Uh, we're not allowed to produce those uh, through the li doing it live, you can't uh, uh, put the songs on uh, unless you have a live band that are performing actually uh, in your uh, web page or at your church, then you can do it, but you cannot do it on a live feed uh, in this way. Uh, so uh, here we are, and I uh, hope you'll enjoy the music. Uh, I have a, uh, a hymn at the end. Uh, you can click on and listen to uh, as well. So uh, that be a part of the closing of, of the service. Let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here this morning. I pray, Father, that you would keep us safe, that you would allow us to uh, enjoy this time of worship together and that we might feel as though we are together this morning and Lord meet our needs. I know that uh, there are financial needs. I know that there are uh, needs for supplies and foods that are hard to get and I pray that you would keep us safe uh, during these days. We also ask Lord that you might uh, in our hearts allow us to focus on you and that in the midst of this that we might trust in you. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Also, dear Father, we ask that you would be with Judy's mother, Lois. We know that she went to the hospital last night uh, with a high fever and other complications, but that uh, Judy has reported that she's doing better. 
So we praise you for that. We thank you for that. And we ask for complete healing. Uh, we pray for those that uh, have tested positive for the virus. Lord, we ask that you might, uh, by your sovereign hand, bring them through this and that they might uh, survive uh, through this. We ask now all of these things in your precious and holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. So, as we look at our passage this morning, kind of looking back just a little bit to kind of tie in what we're doing here, you know, what a marvelous reality was introduced in verses one and two, right? To be chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. Uh, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Then in, in verses 3 through 5, he shows the inheritance reserved for us, which cannot lose its value. It's a wonderful concept that, that those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, uh, that we have this inheritance and that it's reserved for us in our name. And it cannot lose its value at all. It stays the same. And then uh, as he continues in the next few verses, he gives us a reason to rejoice in these troubled times in verses 6 through 9. And now through verses 10 through 12, he affirms the greatness of salvation. So the scripture says, then, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith the salvation of your souls, and of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. So that's kind of an important aspect that we want to look into, how that we rejoice because we believe that the promises of our salvation, the promise of eternal life, the promise of forgiveness of sin, when we ask him into our life, when we ask him to forgive us, he says he'll do it. And then he gives us that eternal life, and he gives us that inheritance that we look forward to. And it's a joy that's inexpressible and full of glory. Now, that salvation, the Old Testament prophets have inquired about that. Uh, that's kind of an important thing. Do you know how great and wonderful your salvation is? Well, Peter points out the fact that what he and the other New Testament writers are saying is the fulfillment of what the prophets have deeply studied. The Old Testament prophets knew so much, yet much was hidden to them, including the character of the church, which you can find in Ephesians chapter 3, and the very essence of life and immortality that you can read in 2 Timothy. Can you imagine how excited Isaiah and Joel and Daniel would have been to read the Gospel of John and the book of Acts to see fully the impact of what they wrote by the Spirit of Christ, which was in them. And it was for us to experience the grace God intended for us. Uh, that's kind of, must have been kind of difficult for the Old Testament prophets. The Holy Spirit shared with them the things that they wanted to, uh, for us to know, and they wrote about them, and yet they didn't have all of it. They knew a little bit of it, and they kept looking, and they kept studying, and they kept wondering, and they kept praying, and they kept wanting to know. They had a real desire, but at the same time, uh, they uh, did have some information. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. We don't often understand uh, or even grab hold of the fact that the Old Testament prophets had an idea of what grace was, that they were going to prophesy about it, and they were going to talk about it, and they wanted to know more about it. But let's uh, take a look at a couple of, of Old Testament passages. I'll do two here, and then I'll do a couple uh, later on. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of what they understood, 
Look at Ezra chapter 9, verse 8. And now for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. Now, as you look at this, and we will uh, look at the definition again, but let me give you kind of a, a quickie on this, that grace is God's passionate desire for us. That's what grace is, and you can see that in this. Now, for a little while, God's desire for us was shown from the Lord our God. What was his desire? To leave a remnant, to escape, to give them a place that God would enlighten their eyes so that they could see his desire for them and give us a measure of a revival for uh, our bondage. Now look at uh, Ze uh, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. This is the grace of salvation. This is the spirit of God's desire for us and prayer. And what is the prophecy? that he would be nailed to a cross, that he would be pierced for our transgressions. This is just a small uh, picture of what crucifixion was going to be. And they didn't even know what that was at this point. It's important for us to know what grace is and what grace does. Need to know that. Grace applies to many levels of our life, not just salvation. So we need to know what grace is. So here it is. Here's the definition. Grace is God's passionate desire toward us. It is what he deeply wants for us that we are unable to secure for ourselves and therefore provides for us. Isn't that marvelous? To know that. To know that. It's his desire. It's what he wants for us. But he also knows we can't secure it on our own. It's not something that, that we can work for or that we can join or that we can somehow uh, grab hold of uh, or even inherit. Just because our parents or an aunt or an uncle or a cousin is uh, deeply involved in uh, the love of the Lord, it, it doesn't pass on through an inheritance in that way. It doesn't pass on because we try to work for it or we, we get baptized for it or we take communion for it. It's not anything that we can secure on our own. So God provides it. Now, there are different kinds of grace. Scripture opens up a lot of different things. Besides his saving grace, it's his empowering grace. He gives us the ability uh, to be gifted by the Holy Spirit, his enlightening grace. And actually, uh, the verse that we looked at talked about uh, in Ezra how uh, the grace from God enlightened their eyes. So there's an enlightening grace. It, it allows us to see things. It's eman emancipating grace. That is, it sets us free. We're not only set free from the law, but we're set free from sin and death, and that we're set free from uh, the sentence of death that for the aspect that, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. We have been uh, uh, set free from that. His enabling grace. He knows that we're not able in our human flesh to be absolutely obedient and to experience the holiness of God. He enables us to do the work that he calls us to do. His enlisting grace. It's by his grace that we are called to do the work that he has for us. For all of this is his multiplied grace. So it's kind of an important thing to understand that God's desire, God's desire for us is to be empowered, to be enlightened, to be set free, to be enabled, to, to enlist in the work that he has for us, and to give us the ability to do all this because we can't secure that by our 
self. Knowing that we are unable to secure these things on our own, God provides them for us. The grace of God allows us to have the opportunity to obtain that which is unobtainable by human effort. That is what grace does. Now, understanding what grace is, God's desire for us, and what grace does provide for us what we are unable to secure by human effort, we're better able to understand what Peter is saying. We begin to have a better picture of how Peter is expressing himself, and he's going to deal with different kinds of grace. He's going to talk about saving grace. That's what we're involved in now. But he'll also talk about the grace that will be revealed when Jesus returns. That's not saving grace. That's completed grace. That's the grace of enablement. That's the grace of empowerment. That's the grace of the, the Holy Spirit who lives in us. It's the grace that God has is coming back for us. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. These prophets were talking about the fact that the Messiah was going to come. They were talking about the fact that he was going to be the Savior of the world. He was talking about the fact that God's desire was that we'd be, we would all be part of his kingdom. Who pro the, the, another verse, the next verse says, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them, that is the Holy Spirit, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So the Old Testament prophets, they prophesied, excuse me, they prophesied about grace that was coming, the grace of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's desire for our salvation. We couldn't get it on our own, so what was he going to do? He was going to provide it. How was he going to provide it? He was going to provide it by Jesus coming into this world, God birthing himself into humanity so that he could be here to die on a cross. He came to die but not just to die and stay dead, but to arise, to have, to have life again, to come back from the dead so that he could have victory over sin and over death and provide the ultimate forgiveness, to be the Passover lamb, to be able to take away our sin. That's what they were prophesying. He, he was coming. The Messiah was coming. Salvation was coming. But there was more to it than that, more to it than that. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the Messiah who would be the Savior of the world, the line of his ancestors. The Bible says in the Old Testament that he would come from the seed of David. In Matthew and in Luke, you have uh, the lineage of Christ. One is actually the lineage of Joseph, and the other is the lineage of Mary. They both come from David. And so that's an important aspect. That would be the fulfillment of that promise, that he would be, uh, the Messiah would be of the line of David. Where he would be born. The Bible tells us that he would be born in uh, Bethlehem of Ephrata, in, Ju in Judah. And so that was several hundred years before uh, Christ was born. They presented that information, that prophecy where he would live, how he would die. They talked about crucifixion, and we'll look at that in Psalm 22. It depicts crucifixion, and they had no idea what that was. It was the Holy Spirit giving that prophecy, the Spirit of Christ in them, to share that, and they wanted to know more of that. His resurrection, his victory over death, his sending of the Holy Spirit, his coming again, the return of Christ, and his earthly kingdom. All of this is involved in, like I said, over 300 prophecies. Can you imagine how difficult uh, it would be to present over uh, a period of uh, several thousand years, because you go all the way back to the book of Genesis in chapter 3, and it gives the first prophecy concerning uh, the coming of the Messiah, but the majority of those prophecies were 
seven, eight hundred years before Christ came. But can you imagine the mathematical probability of all of these prophecies, 300 of them, all coming true in one person at one point in time? It boggles the mind to even begin to think about how all of that could happen only by the sovereign hand of God himself. They also would tell of his intense and gruesome sufferings, which everyone seemed to ignore and were taken by surprise when Jesus was crucified. They thought he was coming to set up the new kingdom. They didn't put together the fact that the Old Testament prophets talked about the sufferings of Christ. Isaiah talks about it in several places in the latter chapters, and I have one here for you. And Isaiah 50 verse 6 said, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. When you begin to look at the Gospels, you find that they, when they were bringing Jesus uh, to uh, the cross, uh, that before they got there, they beat him with whips. Uh, they uh, hit him and, and punched him on his face so that it was bloody and puffy. There was, there was all kinds of blood flowing from the, from the whipping. And they begin to pull out the his be, hair of his beard. And they spit on him on the way to the cross. And all of this was to shame him, but he did not hide from that. Psalm 22, you can read the whole psalm, but just look at verses 14 and 15. This is what he says. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. What a picture of his crucifixion. There are several verses here, and you need to read all of Psalm 22 because it, it gives an absolute beautiful picture, if you want a horrible picture, of the crucifixion of Christ. And yet you can see here these moments when he was on the cross itself and how all of that is predicted here. And so as the verse says, he, that's the Holy Spirit, through the prophets, testified beforehand the suffering of Christ, and the glories that would follow. So they had the sufferings, but what about the glories? The glories that would follow the sufferings of Christ would include the resurrection, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the Messianic kingdom. All of these are part of the glories. So you have testified in the Old Testament, you have prophesied in the Old Testament, the sufferings of Christ, the comings of Christ, where he would live, how he would be born, how he would die, about the resurrection. All of those things are there. And then it adds to that, after those sufferings, after that resurrection, the glories. What a glory. Well, in fact, the psalm says that death could not hold him. The bounds of death could not hold him. He'd be set free. And so he comes forth in the resurrection. And the coming of the Holy Spirit, the book of Joel talks about that and the Messianic kingdom. All of those things are there, and they're glorious. Peter says, these Old Testament prophets searched and studied. They wanted to know more than was given them, but they were keenly aware that it was not for their time, but ours. Imagine with me, if you will, these Old Testament prophets getting from the Holy Spirit. They're, inspiring them to write these things, they don't know what they are. They don't have any idea what they're writing. And yet, they know that this is true because it's coming from the Spirit of God. And it's in them, and they know that this is true, and they're prophesying about it. And yet, some of these things are just held back from them. And they're left with this deep desire to know more. And I can just see them on their knees in prayer, asking God to give them more information. Well, you go to the book of Daniel. My goodness, so much is there. The, one of the most prophetic books in the Old Testament. 
so much about all that was going to happen up to and including the fact that Jesus was going to have the Spirit of God come upon him and that he had come to die and that his kingdom was going to be an eternal one. How marvelous these things are uh, for you to search out. To them, it was revealed, this is what the verse says, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you. Wow. The Holy Spirit revealed it to them. And they realized, oh, wow, this is, they looked around and they go, wow, that's, that doesn't fit for here. That doesn't fit for now. So, yes, Lord, I know it's for another time. It's for another group of people. It is for Israel, but it's also for the Gentiles. Isaiah talks about in several places how this was also for the Gentiles, that all of them, all of us would be together, Jews and Gentiles, the Savior of the world. And so they knew that it was coming, but that they would not get to see it, at least not in the flesh. Now, the apostles were firsthand witnesses of the very things the prophets predicted, and Peter reminds us that they reported those very same things. Look what he says. The things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Peter says, look, the Holy Spirit gave to the prophets all of these things. And you know what? We were witnesses of those things. We heard the message of Jesus. We heard about the things that was going to happen. He taught us the things that we were supposed to tell you. We were present when he was crucified. We were present when he was laid in the grave. We were witnesses of his resurrection. And we were there when he went up into heaven and gave us the, the commission to share his resurrection and the message of the gospel with everyone everywhere throughout the world. Salvation is great marvelous and wonderful because it, is, because it is the primary theme of the prophet's study. And then in verse 11, they, that is the prophets, sought to know what person, what time, the details of the very things that they wrote about. And secondly, salvation is great because it is the theme of the Holy Spirit's inspiration. Verse 11 says, it was the Spirit of Christ within them, that is the Holy Spirit, within them, that was indicating, as he predicted, the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow, the theme of the prophet's study, and the theme of the Spirit's inspiration. Thirdly, Peter comments on the greatness of salvation because it was the theme of the apostles' proclamation. They made it clear that salvation was not through the law, forgiveness was not through the feasts or through the sacrifice of uh, the lambs, it was through Christ. Forgiveness was through him. That was the message announced through those who preached the gospel. The theme of the prophet's study, the theme of the Spirit's inspiration, the theme of the apostles' proclamation. We've learned as we read the New Testament, as we read the Old Testament prophets, as we see the message of the gospel, as we begin to realize that Jesus died on a cross to pay for our sin, that we cannot work for it, that we cannot attain it, that we cannot garner it by ourselves. There's nothing in us at all. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God determined. It is God's desire. He wants us to have forgiveness. He wants us to have eternal life. He wants us to have the, the promise of being with him in the eternal kingdom. He wants all of that for us, yet he knows we cannot get it by ourselves. So he provides it through the death of Christ, through the resurrection, through our ability to take Christ into our hearts 
for our forgiveness. Then finally, the theme of the angel's interest. As you look at the end of verse 12, he says that the angels long to look into the greatness of salvation. They wanted to know. Salvation wasn't for them. Redemption was not for them. They were created beings long before us. God created them for a very specific purpose. Some of them rebelled. We have angels that are uh, uh, angels that that are sinful, that we have angels that are pure, that stayed with Christ, and the angels that sinned became uh, the demons, and they are a big problem for us today, you know, and uh, yet they cannot be redeemed. They're set in their place. Redemption was for those that were created in the image of God. That's us. That's us, okay? But the angels are kind of interested. How is this plan going to work? We know you humans uh, were created in the image of God, but you were given the ability to make your own choices, to make your own decisions, all of that within the sovereignty of God, but we were given that. We were given a free will because we were created in the image of God. So how in the world is this plan of God going to work? And so they watch, and they take a look at everything that happens in our lives. They're there to see, and they begin to wonder, hmm, how's this really going to work? 1 Corinthians 4, 9, and Ephesians 3, 10, and 1 Timothy 3, 16, likewise picture the supernatural world eagerly observing God's program of human redemption. The concept seems grounded in Jesus' words in Luke 15, 7, and 10, where the angels are said to rejoice over one repentant sinner. Imagine that. Every time someone comes to know Jesus as their personal Savior, every time someone prays and asks for forgiveness and asks for Jesus to come into his life, asks to be saved, then they have a party. They rejoice. This is wonderful, all of them. And there are so many angels. Now, it talks about the fact that you can put, you know, millions of them on a, the head, head of a pin, you know. So uh, how many of them, we don't know. But we know they have a big party every time someone comes to the Lord. If you're listening this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you've always counted on your good works or being a good person or not being as bad as person, other people that you know or just kind of figuring that if you joined a church or if you took communion or if you got baptized, that somehow that took care of it. You need to understand that that's not how salvation works. Salvation works by the fact that we're under a death sentence. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We ask God into our life. We ask Jesus to forgive us. We plead for him to be our Savior, and he does, and he fulfills that, and he gives us his spirit, and we become a part of the family of God. This plan of God to redeem sinners by the blood of Christ is so wonderful, so amazing, so great, that even the angels find themselves unable to keep from watching and looking into. We've got an audience. <laughs> They're looking into things. Now, as I, as I think about this message, there are some hymns in our hymnal uh, that just some of the words of the, those hymns kind of come to me, and if you, you don't have a hymnal at home, I'm pretty sure, uh, so uh, you might look up on Google. Isn't that wonderful? God gave Google so we could look things up. Uh, but uh, uh, there's that one that says, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. And you can look up in Google, since Jesus came into my heart, and it'll come up there, and then you'll they'll give you the lyrics. All right, and you can read that. And then uh, also another one says, Christ has for sin atonement made. What a wonderful Savior. Some of you know those hymns, and right now you're, you're singing those words. But if you don't know those words, then look up what a wonderful Savior. Look up since Jesus 
came into my heart in Google and get those words and just, in fact, you probably, they'll probably show you uh, a YouTube video that you can sing along with uh, on, uh, on those hymns and just in, enjoy that uh, this morning, will you? So here we are, the prophets foretold, the apostles proclaimed, the spirit inspires us to sing it again. How great, how great our salvation. Now, there's another hymn, and I've actually posted it on our webpage. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. And I would like that to be uh, our uh, closing hymn this morning. And you, after I close down this uh, and end the, the video, uh, please click on uh, that on the web page and uh, just sing along because he, there's a piano guy. He's playing the song and the words will come up uh, there. And I just want you to sing that. You know, how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to be together this morning, to be able to see the message of salvation and to realize how great, how marvelous, how wonderful it is that you have provided that for us. I ask, dear God, that you might meet our needs this day, that you might provide for every aspect of our life, including our need for salvation. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's people said, amen. God bless, and that's all for today.